Good evening. I'm Ron Williams, Chairman of the Board of the National Western Stock Show, and I want to welcome all of you. Since 1906, the National Western Stock Show has been one of the most beloved events to occur each January across all of Colorado. But you will also see, hear about the excitement ahead as we look to a new National Western Center and the redevelopment of the complex at I-70 and Brighton Boulevard. At this time, I would like to introduce you to the Master of Ceremonies for tonight's event. He is a legend in the history of the National Western Stock Show. We all call him Mr. Stock Show. And we felt it was very appropriate that he MC this event tonight. So, without further ado, I'd like to have you give a nice warm welcome to Pat Grant, our former president and CEO. Thank you, uh, Ron Williams. Let me just say uh, how fortunate we are to have Ron's leadership. Let's give him a big warm thank you. I'm very pleased and very honored to be up here and try and help kind of coordinate some parts of this presentation. But the real show and the real story is about National Western, about its people, about its fun, and about its very colorful past and many, many events. Before I tell an historic tidbit or two, I will be brief. I'm not very good, Paul, at following script, but I will do my best. We all read about the Pope's visit, Pope Francis back east, visiting those major cities. How many of us remember Pope John Paul II coming to Denver, organizing, organizing World Youth Day? And during World Youth Day, we had two to 300 young people from all over the world staying at the National Western in the Hall of Education. We put up cots, we installed new shower systems for and in what we've always known lovingly as the bovine beef palace. <laughs> it was a fun event. We had a bishop's mass in the uh, stadium arena. We will not soon forget that event. Many of you may not have been around, but in the early 1990s, we wanted to do something to celebrate the 90th anniversary and 90th year celebration of the National Western Stock Show and Rodeo. Chuck Sylvester is here somewhere. Chuck will remember that. We helped kick off this craft beer craze. <laughs> Back then, 25 years ago, it was pretty small stuff. Pete Coors was not very worried, not very concerned about, <laughs> about us competing. But we contracted with one of these local brew pubs for a National Western brew, and it was Honey Pale Ale. We call this brew Bullhide. <laughs> we had made about uh, 100 cases of this beer. We sold them all. It, everybody liked them. Everybody drank too much, especially down the cowboy bar. <laughs> I don't recall seeing Chuck down there, but I was surely down there. And all went well until uh, after the show was over and all hell broke loose. Red Bull, the multinational beer distilling marketing company, 
called me from corporate headquarters and said, what in God's name are you doing out there? And who, who in the heck is National Western Stock Show? That was fine until I was served with papers. <laughs> we are infringing their patent as being too close to their patented name. It was the story of David and Goliath, and needless to say, we backed off. <laughs> We have and had historically some fun, loving prankster staff. One staff member who is here tonight, she will remain anonymous, but she is still a member of staff. She now heads volunteer <laughs> programs. <laughs> I will not tell you her name, but she had this brilliant idea and very creative idea. April 1, 1994, 1995, she came up with the idea of a prank. She bought a lot of Oreo cookies, Oreo chocolate cookies. She very carefully separated the chocolate wafers she scraped off that good, sweet cream between the chocolate wafers, and she put in another substance. She then re reconnected those wafers. Nobody could tell a difference. Put them on this plate at the front desk. Billy Saul was our media director. Billy Saul loved to sleep. So he rolled in at work a little late that morning, 9, 9.30. He always came upstairs, always looked for a cup of coffee, and he always ate all the cookies, all the donuts, whatever was inside. He saw these Oreo cookies and he started scarfing those down. The last I saw of Bill that day is he was pinned like mad to the bathroom. <laughs> I asked uh, this young lady, what did you do to the Oreo cookies? <laughs> she said, she said, I just put in some Colgate toothpaste. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> if the truth be told, it was x lax <laughs> The last story, very brief, is a joke on me. Chuck Sylvester and others will remember the time it took to design and build the events, event center, 1995. We did, we finished construction. We held this com contest on what should we name this building? So we had 20 or 30 names suggested submitted. One of those suggestions, Ron Horst smiling, one of those suggestions was Grant's tomb. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, that idea never saw the light of day. We buried it quickly, and I'm still here. <laughs> Really, let's reflect on the reality and the fact that this is a celebration of the past, the present, but now particularly the future. And I want to tell you that there have been five people, many people, but five people representing many organizations that have spent years sitting down, working out, to developing their collective visions for what the future of the National Western would be and will be. First, Kelly Lead, the executive director of <laughs> the executive director of the North Denver Cornerstone Collaborative, working hard for Denver to oversee the multiplicity and the complexity of all these projects. Kelly, you're first. Take it off for you. 
Good evening. So, you know, I, I'm going to, um, I had some prepared remarks, but instead of talking from paper, I'm going to speak from the heart. Um, and I'm going to go to one slide because it just seems um, inappropriate that I talk about formal things, but instead talk about tonight as a third generation Colorado kid who grew up in Northwest Jefferson County on a small farm in Arvada, um, uh, whose father, my dad, wanted to teach my brother and I the importance and value of work. And I didn't learn until high school that they actually had heaters for uh, water troughs. Uh, he used to make us go out there with uh, an ice pick and break up the ice, so I, I still owe him for that one. Um, but, you know, the picture here, um, and, and I want you to focus on the picture, don't focus on the words. Uh, because many of you have heard the presentation. I think I've given a, this presentation 160 or so times over the last six months. What's important about where we sit today is, you know, I, I say all the time, you know, Denver spent the last 30 years running away from its cowtown roots. And one of the things that has come out of this experience when Mayor Hancock came into office in the summer of 2011 was this idea that the stock show might not be in Denver. And that was not okay with the mayor. And we started a conversation about what the stock show could be, how we make sure it's here another year, 100 years. And partners came together and you're going to hear from uh, the partners that have been working on this for a very long time. Hundreds of people, thousands of hours, uh, thinking about how do you take a very unique place that can never be replicated. There, there's no way we could replicate it. But how do we take what's there with all its challenges and turn it into something that not only celebrates our past, honors our past, honors what made this state so great, but at the same time recognize the enormity of the opportunity that sits before us for the next 100 years. And that's the part I want to focus on. Um, you know, we're going to preserve so much of the, the past and the history of this place, which is so important to pass on to future generations. But what I think is, is exciting, and people have heard me say, is when I talk about the story of, of Denver's Cowtown roots and that we spent, you know, again, uh, our time trying to run away from that. I had T-shirts made that say, embrace the cow. <laughs> and people laugh. Um, but the reality is um, that it's not only a recognition of who we are and where we've come from, but what we've discovered together, and you'll hear this tonight, is the power of what's in front of us. Colorado, at this place called the National Western Center, has an opportunity to talk about solving some of the world's biggest issues, food, food and food security, food production, food security issues. We have a chance to celebrate the next 100 years of the National Western Stock Show. We have a chance to uh, expose kids from all over the state uh, about the, our land, our soil, what it means to work, what it means to um, value work, uh, what it means to um, celebrate all the things that make this state and this country so great. Um, and do that in a way that can be experiential and and um, eye-opening in so many ways. Um, and this and this story, this, this, the next chapter, uh, which is represented by this picture, is about growing this place from 130 acres today into a 270-acre campus at the front door uh, at the Queen, on the Queen City of the Plains, Denver, Colorado. And it's a chance to express, again, not only about who we've, where we've been, but where we're going and to blend old and new, uh, and to have this new front door, this new gateway into our great city um, as an expression of, of who we are. And, and you know, the mayor uh, told us when we started this journey um, to be bold uh, and not to be afraid. And we've been working closely with uh, two, the three neighborhoods called Villaria Swansea that are around us to make sure that they're a part of this history uh, as well. And uh, they're our greatest partners and our, and our greatest supporters. Uh, they've been with us uh, all along the way. So, you know, we're, we get the, the opportunity here over the course of the next 
number of years to write the next chapter. And that is such a rare opportunity. And I am personally enormously humbled by it. And I'm so blessed to be working with so many good people to do this. Um, but we've got obviously a lot of work ahead of us. There's gonna be a lot of rough days as we rebuild this place. But at the end of the day, um, again, Colorado can be a place to solve really big issues. You know, the mayor talks about a global stage. Well, here's the global stage, the National Western Center. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for um, um, being a part of this history, and thank you for helping us write the next chapter. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to George Sparks. Thank you. George Sparks. George is the president and CEO of where we are right now, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Thank you. Thank you, George. I, I can't tell you how much respect I have for, for Kelly. He's, he's got an incredibly complicated project here, and he's, he's doing a fabulous job on it. So, so at the museum here, uh, we're not cowboys. We can't even play one on television. We can't fake it. Uh, we're scientists. And working in a place like this, you get a perspective, and you get a perspective of time and, um, you know, the human condition and, and what humans do. And right there is what is the stock show, and that's what it looks like today. And Doug talked about his family being here uh, in 1860. And I hate to say this to the stock show folks, but you weren't even the first, you're not the first stock show. You're not even the first stock show on that site. <laughs> because 1860 centuries ago, every day was a stock show. And that's what it looked like. And there weren't cowboys, there were mammoth boys. And uh, there actually weren't any boys around then, but this was the American Serengeti. That's the South Platte River about 180,000 years ago. Uh, horses actually evolved in North America. Horses lived here, camels lived here, mammoths, mastodons. It, was a, it literally was a stock show every single day. And then about 15,000 years ago, humans arrived on the scene and began, you know, what you would call ranching or harvesting these animals here to survive. And, and our dream is that we can tell the story about the long, deep time part of that place and, and help rejuvenate the river help people appreciate uh, from a time perspective exactly how humans have impacted it and what humans are likely to do in the future. And as a part of that, this is, uh, this is us discovering a, a, uh, a fabulous antique bison that's now uh, extinct. Kathy D. and Peter were there the day that this bison was discovered up at Snowmass. Kathy helped name this. It's named uh, Jessie Baldera after her mentor in, uh, in high school, and she was she, it was a very emotional day when we found this, and it is, it, and you can, I'll bet you a month's salary that we can find something like this down there along that river. So from a programming point of view, we'd love to be able to, to go discover where these critters are buried up there now, and also to do uh, human digs. Our dream is to have a live archaeological dig that would dig back through not only history that Ed talks about, but all the way back to when humans first got here 10 to 15,000 years ago. And having done one of these digs, out on the Eastern Plains, there aren't many things more thrilling than to find either something like a, a bison or a mastodon or a camel, but also to discover a little shard created by a human being that lived here 10,000 years ago and lived off the animals that were part of the original stock show on this site. So that's what, one of the things that we hope to do. We think it could engage the public in a, a very, very different way, which probably is a good segue to bring us up to Ed Nichols, who's going to talk about the history of the last maybe couple hundred years of people in Colorado. Ed Nichols, representing History Colorado. Thank you, Ed. History Colorado really has a number of different components that we can use and will interface as we look forward to what we envision History Colorado as a partner in the National Western Center and where it's going to be involved in the future. And those different parts include the collection, the artifacts that we have, which you see. Here's an example uh, of one that came from our collection. It's a poster from the predecessor of the, of the uh, History Colorado, uh, of the National Western. And it's the, uh, it's the National Stock Growers Convention. If you look at that date, that's 1898. History Colorado was founded in 1879. so. We've been working together on this for a long time, and the artifacts, the collection that we have, speak to that. 
Another thing that we have that will be employed in the future is the education programs from History Colorado. And as we talk about those education programs and what they can be, I look to partnering with George and others as we talk about the programs that he's talked about and things that we can be doing. Exhibits and programs. These are sorts of things that we do on an ongoing basis and as we look forward how they'll be utilized in the upcoming National Western Center and its, its uh, rollout. A State Historic Preservation Office, or SHPO, the whole concept of preservation through the State Historic Fund, the Grants Program, the State Historic Preservation Office, the Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, they're all part of the History Colorado complex and things that we can bring together to employ and moving forward on this. History Colorado's mission is to inspire generations to find wonder and meaning in the past, to build a better Colorado. We just saw a wonderful representation of the history of the National Western. What better way can we employ that vision, that mission, to talk about the past and move it into, as Bill Convery said in that, in that clip, can we live in the past? Can we see the past and live in the future? And I think this partnership is one of the ways where we can really accomplish what he's talking about there. So why is it that we got involved with it as, as a partner? It's that very reason. It's taking a very iconic element of Colorado's past and making sure that it's preserved and that it moves into the future. So that's why we became a partner in this whole National Western study. It's, as we look at the National Western, it's an iconic element of Colorado's past in two ways. One, it embodies the character of the, of the West. It embodies the character of Colorado. And as we talk about that, it's, it's the character of the West is signified by members of the agribusiness community, the cattlemen, the ranchers, farmers, the cowboys and cowgirls, that independent spirit that drives the reputation and the, the character of Colorado and its people. But secondly, it's also an iconic sense of place. If we look at the National Western site, it's very important that that be preserved. That's one of those elements where we talk about the preservation of not only the buildings, but the place itself. Keeping that whole focus on the National Western and moving it into the National Western Center. It's a focus for tourists who come into the community. It's a focus for re to return visitors. I, as a youth growing up in Colorado Springs, uh, would come up here with our family, and it was one of those things that we would do every year, and you knew, and you know where it is because of the iconic buildings and places that are there. So we talked about the predecessor, the National uh, Stock Growers Convention, but what else, and how else can we use the elements of History Colorado? As we work it, we look at how can we be involved, or what do we see, what do we envision in the future? The assistance in the preservation and building of the site through the Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, including such things as historic assessments, assessments on buildings and structures so that you can look to and continue to work with these iconic places and keep them preserved to restore them and to build them. We're looking at possible grants from the State Historic Fund to help fund that very work that we're talking about. Interestingly enough, and I don't think uh, many people, enough people know that History Colorado, the Office of Archaeology and Historic Preservation and the State Historic Fund, the Preservation Programs Group, work with tax credits. And as we look at tax credit assistance, uh, what does that mean? What can that be? A good example is that the, during the Union uh, Station uh, program and, and getting that underway and building that, there were $8 million in tax credits rendered through History Colorado's assistance and the preservation programs within History Colorado. We also can talk about education programs. Again, working with organizations like DMNS and what George talked about. We have the Office of Archaeology and the State Archaeologist um, and programs in education that could be worked there. History Colorado today works with education programs with over 40,000 students a year. And I can envision how those could be entwined in both History Colorado and in our own programs there, but also on site as you move out to the National Western. 
a collection of stories through oral histories, a program that we started last year through a grant, uh, a very important grant. But we're talking about getting oral histories for story, for research, and for stories. And uh, as was said earlier, one of the best things we can do is tell stories about Colorado and its past. We can talk about program expertise. Using these photographs, this collection of artifacts, and creating an environment throughout the campus as we move into the National Western Center and we take Colorado's past into its future. That is such an important role that I envision that History Colorado can participate in. And I look forward to seeing how that's done and the accomplishments it'll be. We're very proud to be a partner in this National Western Center movement and I hope you all will join us in that. It's now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who's the Vice Chancellor at Colorado State University. Please help me welcome Amy Parsons. Thank you. Good evening. I was telling a few of my colleagues that I was at a, at a conference in San Francisco yesterday. It was the Urban Land Institute Conference in San Francisco, and I was asked to serve on a panel about the the new role of food in urban cities in America. And it was a, a big conference room packed with people all talking about the new role of food and agriculture within cities and how cities are building developments and developers are building small farms and things like that to bring the farm and food into the cities. And people around the room would say things like, you know, you can't eat online. You can't grow food online. Food is the great common denominator that brings people together, and that's where, where we really need to focus. And I was next to Charlotte, North Carolina, and Anaheim, California, who have done great food districts within their cities. But when I get a chance, I think when any of our partners get a chance to tell the story about what Denver has been doing for the last 100 years with food and agriculture within the city and what we're envisioning for the future, it's really clear that there, there is no project in the U.S. like this one. There's no project that can hold a candle to what we're doing here in Denver, Colorado, and, and what the future holds. And that's, that's really clear. It's very exciting. Now, I represent Colorado State University, and we've, of course, been proud partners with the National Western Stock Show since the very beginning. Does anybody in the room know what CSU's name was before it was CSU? I think I heard it, Colorado A&M, right? Yeah, Colorado A&M. Uh, founded in 1870, we were the state's land-grant institution. We are the state's land-grant institution, really rooted in agricultural extension and outreach in the state of Colorado. Does anybody know what these characters are, are doing in the early 1900s up on a hill outside of Fort Collins? Painting the A, what does the A stand for? The Aggies. We used to be the Aggies. Our colors, I believe, were pumpkin and alfalfa back then. <laughs> so it's no surprise that we've been a proud partner of the National Western since the very beginning. And, and actually, in the early days, CSU would close campus to allow all of our students and faculty to attend the National Western Stock Show. And that's something I think Paul and Ron and I would like to bring back someday if we can talk Tony into it. So, of course, over time, uh, you know, countless faculty and students have been involved with the National Western, and today it's, it's a very important source of scholarship funds for our animal science students. Uh, George, I guess that makes us both uh, scientists and cowboys, right? Yes, that's CSU. Yeah, we got them both. Uh, does anybody know these, these two characters riding the stagecoach last January? I bet you can tell Tony Frank, that's our president and CEO on the stagecoach, and this picture cracks me up because he looks slightly terrified in that picture, but does, it, does anybody know who the guy is on the top? Ah, oh, I got some football fans, that's right. That's our football coach, Mike Bobo, getting in the game last year, too. So, of course, every January, CSU is in full effect at the National Western Stock Show, really bringing out agricultural education to the nearly one million visitors that attend, talking about what agriculture is today. So, we're so proud to be a partner now in this conversation, looking at the needs of the site and the National Western, bringing into focus what the future holds that you've heard from the other partners as well. And for us, this is a lot about what agriculture looks like today. Agriculture innovation and agriculture and food science is really booming along Colorado's front range and along, you know, all over Colorado like it never has before. I'll show you this bubble diagram, which you can't make out very well, but our scientists at CSU undertook a comprehensive study in the last year looking at where food innovation is occurring in Colorado, looking at the the increased intersections of food and agriculture and beverage and water and bioenergy. And when you look at the number of patents and research grants and publications and startup companies that are coming out of Colorado's Front Range, we have this really intense cluster of innovation happening along Colorado's Front Range that's really remarkable. 
people are moving to Colorado, companies, talented people are moving to Colorado to be close to this agriculture innovation cluster, looking at everything from soil to market. And we know that innovation drives the economy in Colorado and the economy in the U.S. And we know specifically that food innovation is what's really necessary to meet the challenges that we face globally, from local urban food deserts to food security to our need to feed a planet of nine billion people. The answers to that's gonna come through agricultural innovation and the innovation that we need to work on our precious and limited water supply. We need to do it sustainably and smartly. And the opportunity that we have here in Denver with this National Western Site is no less than staking our claim to the title of the Silicon Valley of Agriculture here in Denver, where this rich history of what we have really meets the future and ag innovation. These are going to be CSU's facilities on the site. Ecoin Sports Medicine and Community Outreach Clinic, a water resources center with hands-on environmental education and research and teaching and lab space, and the CSU Center for Classroom and Lab and Shared Exhibit Space, Performing and Visual Arts Space, Extension Centers, K-12, all of that integrated right into the site. And by embedding these CSU facilities into the site, we'll be able to meet our mission in new ways that we never have before. We envision bringing in everybody from K-12 to lifelong learners, from local neighbors to global tourists coming in just for this. Does anybody recognize this building? 1909 Arena reimagined as a Colorado foods marketplace where we have a, an everyday farmer's market showcasing Colorado's goods and merchandise where people will come from all over to experience Colorado's goods and agricultural products. We want to bring in artists and conference goers and innovators and inventors. We hope that this is a place for anybody who has an idea or has an issue to solve or a product to test or a a problem that they really want to get to the bottom of and engage in research, that this is the place that they're, come, that they're going to come to do it and there's going to be no place else like it in the world. And for CSU, it's all about the research. It's about fueling this economy of ag innovation, about ag literacy in the next generation and taking the last 150 years of research and our best thinking and applying it to the future. For the next generation, for our future leaders, for food and sustainability and agriculture and beverage, ultimately for the health of our people and for our planet. And that's the opportunity that we have here at the National Western Center, and I also think that's the responsibility that we all collectively have at this site. Thank you. And Paul Andrews, President, <laughs> President, CEO, National Western Stock Show. But thank you all for being here. You know, as I look out and as I got to interact with many of you before the program started here tonight, you know, you truly are a family. Everybody that has the National Western Stock Show running through their veins, and I dare say every one of you have the National Western Stock Show running through your veins. Uh, I could have my car break down anywhere in the great state of Colorado, and one of you would be nearby. I know that. And that's just kind of the way we are, isn't it? So uh, fantastic. But I'm going to go through some of the buildings uh, that we will be both renovating as well as using new on the complex. You see a site uh, shot right here of the Stadium Arena renovated. And Amy talked a little bit about that. Uh, but obviously, it's historic. It was built in 1909. And that building will be celebrated on this campus as we look forward. Next, you see a shot of the new arena and then the National Western Center uh, photo there, which would be the new Expo Hall. So the arena, probably from where you're looking, is on your left side, and the new Expo Hall is on the right. So the new arena, for us, what a great opportunity to grow the great sport of rodeo. 10,000 seats and 40 suites is in the plan. That's exactly 40 more suites than we have today. <laughs> sure about that, so I'm 100% sure about that, yes. So what an opportunity for us, both financially and educationally, to get many more people exposed to the great sport of rodeo in a state-of-the-art arena that not only will be great in January, but year-round will become one of the great entertainment venues across this state. The Expo Hall, 
Boy, I can tell you my staff is celebrating today and will definitely celebrate the day that Expo Hall opens up. As you know, our shopping experience, although it's good, can be challenging, uh, especially at times on the middle weekend when you are elbow to elbow trying to walk through and have a nice Western experience and buy some Western items. Uh, this is a 450,000 square foot building that will come up on site. Today we have about a little more than 200,000 square feet and the staff does a great job of putting uh, uh, almost 800 booth spaces across that entire site. But we turn away about 350 applicants every year that want to be part of our trade show. So a new expanded trade show footprint will give us the ability to have a world-class trade show even better than you see today. And there is a rhyme and reason why those two buildings are next to each other. If you ask one of our trade show exhibitors uh, at Stock Show, they'll tell you they need that trade show building to be right next to the rodeo arena so that everyone has to come through the trade show to go by the rodeo arena. So that really drives a lot of sales activity for us. Here is a tremendous shot of what the future will look like for the equestrian center and the new livestock center. Uh, and you're seeing that really from the, that picture would be taken heading to the east, so you'd be standing maybe in the South Platte River where that picture is taken. But the equestrian center will be everything that we cannot accomplish today. Today we're limited by our stalling. We have a little more than 600 stalls we can get to on our site. We are in eight by 10 stalls. That's no longer competitive for what we have to do. This building will have multiple show arenas, two show arenas, one 5,000 seats and another one 500 seats. And it will have a thousand permanent 10 by 10 stalls. It will have multiple warm up areas. This will allow us to compete for some of the largest shows in the world that today we can't even pitch. So the National Western Stock Show itself in January will be able to have much more advanced programming than we do today. And in the February to December time frame, this facility will be filled with the world's greatest horse shows. And they will be celebrating in Denver, Colorado, instead of in the sweltering heat in Tulsa, Fort Worth, and Oklahoma City. Not that those places are bad, but in June, July, and August, I dare say, tough places to be with your horse. Next, the shot you're seeing there of the new Livestock Center. It will have a show arena, 2,500 seats with push a button, and it can get up to 4,500 to 5,000 seats. So that'll be great flexibility year round. But at the National Western Stock Show, it will also have 230,000 square feet of barns. That will allow our livestock department to grow our show by up to 30%. Now that is going to be a huge number. We'll go from 15 to 16,000 head of livestock across our site in 16 days to near on 25,000 head of livestock. Today we're turning away about 1,000 exhibitors that want to come uh, exhibit their hogs. And we're, we're turning away many, many more individuals that want to show their cattle. So this will be a great opportunity for our livestock team to grow the show. And we're very excited about that. Those two buildings are sitting next to each other because when we need to attract a horse show in February through December that requires 3,000 stalls, and there are several of those, those two buildings will be used together in order to secure that bid. And lastly, but certainly not the least, probably the most important part of this complex for us, at least for all of us that know the history of this great institution, the yards. The yards will be expanded to 20 acres. This again will allow the livestock department to acquire many more entries in the yard show at the National Western Stock Show. Uh, that shot you're seeing there is uh, again from the plat looking over towards the east and the yards can, although they're going to be not permanent structures, they really can't be permanent. We need to find a way collectively to celebrate the authenticity of the current yards 
and incorporated into yards that come up in January, have the same feel, same fever pitch that we, that we enjoy in the yards today, and then they come down and become a multi-purpose uh, event space the remainder of the year, where huge events can occur across the site, both uh, benefiting the city of Denver and celebrating agriculture and our heritage. So the yards are going to grow and they will continue to be celebrated. We, as you, many of you know, are one of the only yard shows in the world, if not the only yard show in the world. So as I close, let me just paint a quick picture for you. We are weeks away from changing the past, the present, and the future. And thank you for all your volunteerism and hard work. I know my staff's out here too, uh, for the National Western to make it as great as it has been for the last 109 years. And we celebrate our 110th this January. So with that, we are done. Uh, thank you to all our speakers. And I'm happy to open it up for a few questions for any of us, if any of you have any out there. So again, thank you for coming.